Good morning, Disciple Church. It's such a privilege to be up here and read to you the word today. Will you please stand with me? We'll be in Matthew chapter 8, starting in verse 1. When he came down from the mountain, great crowds followed him. And behold, a leper came to him and knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priests, and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a proof to them. This is the word of the Lord. According to the World Health Organization, the top, te- top 10 causes for death, uh, nine of them are related to sickness and illness. Starting with number 10, and this is across the world. This is the top 10 reasons why causes for death uh, across the world. I mean, number 10, at tuberculosis, nine, excuse me kids, diarrheal diseases. Uh, number eight is road injury meaning that's not a disease, <laughs> but that shows you that it's dangerous. These streets are dangerous, aren't they? That's literally the number eight reason why people die in the world. Number seven is diabetes. Number eight, trachea, bronch- uh, bronchial or lung cancers. Number five, Alzheimer's disease uh, and other forms of dementia. Number four, lower respiratory infections. Number three, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Number two, stroke. And number one, heart disease. People are dying every day in our city and all around the world, and most everybody is dying from sickness and illness. It is nine out of 10 reason, top 10 reasons why people die. Many of us are very familiar with sickness, either because we are currently sick, have been sick, or are living with somebody who is sick, have had loved ones who are sick. In fact, cancer is, has basically affected every household. Um, according to the cancer.org, they say that in females, one in every three female will eventually develop some form of cancer in their lifetime. Um, some of them being bladder, brain, breast, colon, esophageal, um, kidney, larynx, leukemia, liver, lung, melanoma, uh, oral, pancreas, stomach, thyroid. And, and in men, one in two. One in two men. So men... We got it worse than women. (laughs) One in two men will develop cancer sometime in their life. We're a sick people, aren't we? We're a diseased people, aren't we? It makes sense that why in our culture, in our world, there's such a concern for health. There's such a concern for how you eat. And and we're in a developed nation where we, we have the the luxury to have health be an industry. In other parts of the world, there are more important things like trying to produce enough food for people. Um, Well, our text today that we're going to be in is continuing in the book of Matthew, and it's actually starting a new section. We just finished going through the preaching to the Sermon on the Mount, and it was... I'll go ahead. Uh, hand, uh, raise your hand if there was, if you've been with us and you've been following, that there has been at least one moment where you were like, whoa, Jesus is serious. Anybody? Serious, right? When he was explaining uh, who he is and what he's about and what the kingdom is, and uh, he, there was all kinds of correcting going on in the Sermon on the Mount. I mean, he comes in and says, hey, blessed are those. He talks about the kingdom. And a lot of these blessings are not what we think, right? Blessing if you're, if you're mourning, blessing if you're meek, blessing if you're thirsty, blessing if you're persecuted. 
And he goes on to make all kinds of corrections of correct interpretations of the law, correct practice of righteousness, correct relationships, because he's stepping into a world and a situation that there's a whole lot of sin and there's a whole lot of people uh, living in a way that is unworthy and, and disobedient to the word of God. And he's coming in and showing that he truly is the king of the kingdom of God. Well, uh, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, which we had last week, it ended with the crowds being astonished at the authority with which he, he was teaching. He was not just another man. He was not just another rabbi. He was unique. And literally, their mouths were, were, were left open. They were, they were flabbergasted. Choose a word that's helpful. If we are to read the Sermon on the Mount and appropriately, we should be emotionally affected by what we read. Because apparently, the sermon that Jesus gave People were just awestruck. Who is this man? The authority with which this man teaches is unlike anybody we've ever seen. And so we're going to be transitioning now in, in our text to the next chapter, which is chapter 8. And this is actually a, a, a break um, to, to start the new section. And it's connected to the teaching, but it's, it's, it's different. Let me read this uh, description of all the things that have happened up to this point, or at least the major, the major parts in the, in the book of Matthew. In establishing Jesus' messiahship, this is all about pointing out that Jesus really is the one who is to come. Matthew, in his gospel, has demonstrated that Jesus has legal qualification through his genealogy. He's demonstrated his prophetic qualification through the fulfillment of the prophecies by his birth and his infancy. His divine qualification by the Father's own attestation at his baptism. Remember, he said, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. His spiritual qualification for his perfect resistance of Satan's temptation. And his theological qualification through the teaching of the Sermon on the Mount. We are getting clearer and clearer and clearer a picture that this Jesus is the one who is promised who is to come. He is God's Messiah his servant, his savior, his king. He's the one. And that's what Matthew's trying so clearly to, to march out. Well, in this last, last section, he is the teacher of the law, he's the giver of the law, he's the interpreter of the law, and he's the one that demands obedience. If you remember, Jesus is not somebody that you could say, ah, maybe later. You either follow him and you build your house on the rock by obeying all of his commands, or you don't follow him, and he says, flee from me, I never knew you, you workers of lawlessness. You could say um, <clears throat> that this section is a section that is going to now put his words on display. In fact, um, Matthew 8, chapter 1, or Matthew chapter 8, verse 1, he's transitioning off the mountain, because it was called Sermon on the Mount, right? Well, he's coming down from the mountain now, and it says, he came down from the mountain, and great crowds followed him. He was obviously popular. He was an incredible teacher, and people heard him and were, were continuing to follow him and flock. Now, that doesn't mean they were all believers. That doesn't mean they were all disciples. That just means that he was drawing a crowd by his incredible teaching. You could not, I mean, literally, hear this man who's talking like this, who's teaching like this. Um, I want to remind us, Matthew chapter 4 tells us who these crowds are. Matthew 4, verse 24 says, So his fame spread throughout all of Syria, and he brought, they brought him all the sick and those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed with demons, those having seizures and paralytics, and he healed them, and great crowds followed him. These are the great crowds from Galilee, Decapolis, from Jerusalem and Judea, from beyond the Jordan. Just a reminder that this crowd is a mixed crowd. Galilee. Jewish, Decapolis, Gentile, Jerusalem, city, Judea, uh, more of the, the lower, smaller, less urban centers, and from beyond the Jordan. This crowd was a mixed crowd of, of, of all kinds of people and it, all kinds of hurting people, right? We saw that there's disease, people with diseases and afflicted and oppressed and seizures and paralytics. And so 
just by way of orienting us, uh, we're actually in a section here to where it's transitioning. And uh, let me just remind us, if we haven't heard it from the past, that this whole book is about teaching about the kingdom of God and how Christ is the king. That's why we call it Jesus is the king of the kingdom. So we're in the middle of a kingdom sandwich. Um, Matthew chapter 4, verse 23, and Matthew chapter 9, verse 35 are parallels. And they're actually, if you think of a sandwich, it has two pieces of bread, right? The bread usually is the same. You usually don't have, you know, two different types of bread in a sandwich, right? Well, these are meant to clue you in. It's called an inclusio. Uh, go, yeah, let's show that there. And it says, he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, which are his kingdom words, Sermon on the Mount, and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. Those are his kingdom works. And so we're now in the section, you could show that sandwich there, um, of how we're, we're starting this new part, Matthew chapter 8. And so um, what are we going to learn about Jesus' healings? He's going to have nine healing stories in chapters 8 and 9, and each healing story starts to un display more and more and of who he is. And so let me read verses 1 and 2 here of Matthew chapter 8. It says, when he came down from the mountain, great crowds followed him, and behold, look, behold means look, a leper came to him and knelt down, it's the, I, it's the word for worship, before him, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. We're only going to be in four verses today, but they're very powerful verses that teach us about Jesus, and so we're going to ask the question, what can we learn about Jesus from the, the cleansing of the leper. This is a famous story told in multiple gospels, not just this one. This is shared in multiple gospels. What can we learn? What are we trying, what is Matthew trying to teach us? What are we supposed to know about Jesus? And it's this. It's more of the same, but it's very important. It's the main point of the whole book. It's that King Jesus displays that he indeed is the Messiah. Matthew chapter 8 verse 3. Look at how Jesus responds to this cleansing of the leper. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him. The leper was, a, was considered a dirty man and he asked to be clean because he knew he was dirty societally, ceremonially. And what did Jesus do? He reached out his hand, touched him, and said, I will be clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. Imagine you're a part of this crowd and you just got wowed by Jesus' incredible works or words, his incredible sermon of, whoa, this Jesus is no joke. He is not messing around. He is calling us to full obedience. I better listen up and perk up, and I better follow this guy to keep learning what he's talking about, because this, this is a big deal. And what happens next? He goes down from the mountain, and a leper shows up, which would have, by the way, what you... I, 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 wouldn't be surprised if you would have heard a gasp. If a leper shows up during that time, a leper was somebody who was, who was supposed to be outside of the people of God because they were diseased and sick and contagious and could negatively affect the people around them. And so when a leper pops up, people go, <gasps> and they step back. And Jesus is no longer, uh, he's no longer teaching them like he was. He's now going to say, okay, words are important, but works are also important. I'm gonna show you what's going on. Here's this opportunity. And Jesus actually, by cleansing this leper, shows that he really is the Messiah who is to come. Let me uh, read from Matthew chapter 11. Further on in the, in the book, um, in fact, this is a part where John the Baptist is in jail. He, he went after uh, King Herod, and, and he got in jail for it because he was calling him out for his sin. And John the Baptist, his own cousin, was doubting whether or not Jesus really was the Messiah, which is interesting, right, to show you that even Johnny B., John the Baptist, even Johnny B. was, was like, whoa, whoa, Jesus, whoa, right? He was expecting a, a, a conquering king. And so let's read in, in Matthew chapter 11, uh, look what it says. Now, when John heard in prison about the deeds, see the deeds, of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples from jail and said to him, 
are you the one who is to come? Are you really the guy, Jesus? And he sends his disciples. Or shall we look for another? Did we miss it here? Are you the guy, Jesus? Because I'm seeing what you're doing, and, and I'm, I'm expecting a, a, a king, a conquering king, to come in and take over Rome and to slash the heads of our enemies. But you're doing, um, you know, I'm not seeing that yet. Are you really the guy? Did we miss it? And look at what Jesus answers. This is a very important moment. Look at how Jesus responds to, Jesus, are you truly the Messiah? He says this, verse 4. Jesus answered them, go and tell John. Go back to your, you know, disciples. Go tell John what you hear and what you see. Remember, kingdom words and kingdom deeds. What you hear and what you see. The blind receive their sight and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor have the good news preached to them. Jesus says, you want to know if I'm the Messiah? Look at my life and seeing what I'm, listen to what I'm saying and look at what I'm doing. It matches up exactly with what the Old Testament said you should expect. Look at my life. In fact, he goes on to say, blessed are the ones who are not offended by me. Meaning a lot of people were saying, Jesus, you're supposed to be different. And he's like, blessed are the ones who are not telling me how I'm supposed to be. Blessed are the ones who are following me and not offended by me, but are saying, you're the king. Whatever you do is great. Let's do this. I'm on your team. And so Isaiah, there's several passages, but I'll just show, show one in Isaiah. Um, chapter 35 there's a promise coming, starting in verse 3. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come, the coming one, with vengeance. See, this is part of it. Uh, they're like, see, you're supposed to come with vengeance. But it says, and with recompense, he will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. And then the lame man shall leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute shall sing for joy, for water breaks forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. And there's, there's more. There's several more. Isaiah 61. I mean, there's all kinds of messianic prophecies. But there was an anticipation. When the Messiah comes, he's going to break open a, a whole new world of health. The, the broken world that we're experiencing, he's going to fix. He's going to fix. And so Jesus really is the Messiah, the one from the Lord. And his, his works, his Miracles are proving that he's the one who's to come. Let's look at uh, another part of what we can learn from this passage. Uh, our first was that Jesus really is the Messiah. Our, our second point for the morning is that King Jesus displays his full authority to make us clean. Jesus displays his full authority to make us clean. Let's spend a little bit more time talking about this condition of leprosy and how uh, the leper asks to be cleansed. Uh, starting in verse 2 again. Behold, a leper came and, and knelt before him saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. Uh, it's an important thing that he, he didn't say, you can heal me. He said, there's a different word for that. He said, you can make me clean, which has to do with ceremonial Uncleanness, which means he doesn't have access to God or the people of God. In his day, and even now, leprosy is considered unclean, untouchable. It has to do with presence. You cannot be in other people's presence because you're unclean. And Jesus was willing. He says, if you will, which, by the way, can give us a, a, a bit of a, the part of, of the leper's heart. Jesus didn't come in and demand healing. He didn't demand healing. Look at how he asks. He says, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. Which is actually an important thing for us. Um, even when Jesus was doing all kinds of miracles, it wasn't like people could just phone in a miracle. It wasn't just like Jesus was your, you know, put in your coin and get out a miracle. He's your miracle worker who's working for you. No, no, no. Jesus is the king. And he will heal whom he will heal, and he will not heal whom he will not heal. And this has everything to do with the authority of Jesus Christ and him being the one who is in charge to make the call on what he will do or not. 
So even back then, when all of these miracles were happening, they were never on demand. This is a good example of a humble heart who believes in the authority of Christ to say, whatever you will, I know you can. I, see, I know you can. I know you have the power to do it. But whatever you will, important posture of humility and belief about miracles. Let me show, uh, so I'm, there's going to be some pictures here. Uh, I'm not trying to be too graphic, but I did want to give you an, an idea of that leprosy was so difficult to live with. It, it was comprehensive. In fact, I want to read a statement here that describes the experience of somebody with the lep leprosy. So you can just listen as I, and, and see the screen as I, as I read this. It says, the disease which we today call leprosy generally begins with pain in certain areas of the body. Numbness follows. Soon the skin in such spots loses its original color. It gets to be thick and glossy and scaly. As the sickness progresses, the thickened spots become dirty sores and ulcers due to poor blood supply. The skin, especially around the eyes and the ears, begin to bunch with deep furrows between the swellings so that the face of the afflicted individual begins to resemble that of a lion. Fingers drop off or are absorbed. Toes are affected similarly. Eyebrows and eyelashes drop out. By the time one can see the person in this pitiable condition, by, yeah, one person can see them in this pitiable condition. By a touch of the finger, one can also feel it, not just see it. Even, even you can smell it because the leper emits a very unpleasant odor. Moreover, in view of the fact that the disease-producing agent frequently also attacks their larynx, the, the leper's voice acquires a, a grating quality, and the throat becomes hoarse. And you can now not only see and feel and smell, but you can also hear the effect of the leprosy. And if you stay with him or her for some time, you can, e you can imagine what a peculiar t taste might be in your mouth, probably due to the odor. This is a devastating disease. Devastating disease. And it's no, no wonder why people were so scared of it. Because it would literally take over every part of your body. And it was so so difficult to live with. In fact, um, there's a few chapters written in Old Testament just given to it. I won't read all the chapters, but I do want to read some sections from Leviticus talking about leprosy um, and how it was very important to you, in order for you to be clean before God, be able to, to worship, um, you couldn't have leprosy. It needed to be checked out by a priest, and it needed to be confirmed whether you have it or don't have it, or if you're in the process of, of it leaving. Um, Leviticus 13, verse 12 says, And if the leper's disease breaks out on the skin, so that the leper's disease covers all the skin of the diseased person from head to toe, as far as the priest can see, then the priest shall look, and if the leper's disease has covered all his body, he shall pronounce him clean of the disease. If it has turned white, he is clean. And he's, talk, he's kind of talking me the sentence about, hey, if it's on its way better, uh, he can be clean from this. But it says, but if the flesh, uh, raw flesh appears on him, then he shall be unclean. And the priest shall examine the raw flesh and pronounce him unclean. Raw flesh is unclean, for it is leprous disease. But if the raw flesh recovers and turns white again, then she, he shall come to the priest, and the priest shall examine him. And if the disease has turned white, then the priest shall pronounce him diseased, the diseased person clean. He is clean. Um, this was not only a physical sickness and illness. It was a social. They, they, they quarantined the sick person seven days at a time or until they got clean. Um, in fact, I, I genuinely believe that uh, the Bible is fully sufficient. The sufficiency of Scripture means that the Bible has everything we need for life and godliness, and, and that it, it has some principle related to every part of life. It doesn't mean that the Bible has, is a manual for how to change your car or how to you know, paint your house, although it does talk about walls in your house. It does say that. Uh, but that I truly believe that the, the Scripture is sufficient to, to, to give us everything we need for life and godliness. And, um, and one of them is how, disease. disease. I, I, it does talk about how uh, when somebody is diseased with an infectious disease, 
you quarantine the individual. Uh, you don't quarantine the society, you quarantine the individual. And you say, um, put those people who are sick out so that we protect the society. In fact, some people think this was cruel because as a leper, you had to yell unclean if you were around people. And this is where some of our modern people, maybe you even in the room, they really struggle with these sort of concepts because it feels so uh, ostracizing. And here's the deal, because it is so ostracizing and it feels mean to have to yell unclean. But I think what we don't realize is that this is actually a very loving thing and this is very appropriate for everybody involved. Sickness is not God's initial design. Remember in the garden? It was perfect, it was wonderful, it was great. Sickness is not just a part of the story that's always ever been. Sickness is a result of sin. And so because there is sickness in this world, it's supposed to point us to the fact that there is sin in this world and that we are, every time we see sickness, and it's sickness is, it's, the sickness is supposed to teach us about sin. It's supposed to say sin will kill you and sin will spread and so if you, are, if you are full of sin, it's supposed to be like a, like a, a teaching, teaching people about the, the deeper things of life. It was meant to be an object lesson. So it's not mean. It's actually by us being able to tell people who are sick to quarantine themselves, we're supposed to get the deeper meaning within it to say, ah, oh, sickness came from, from sin and sin is devastating and brings death. We should not be around it. We should not... We should make sure that we keep ourselves from it. And we should pray to God that he will heal us from it. He will cleanse us from it. It was all a lesson. It wasn't mean. It was actually pointing us to the need for a gospel in the law. The law, part of the purpose of the law is to point us to the need that we need a savior in this broken world. And that's what it was doing. So leprosy was very much connected to this idea of sin. In fact, in Numbers chapter 12, it said very clearly, uh, in response to sin, God gives leprosy. Like, l listen to this. Uh, N Numbers 12, verse 10. When the cloud removed from, the, from over the tent, behold, Miriam was leprous, um, like snow. And Aaron turned around in Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. And Aaron said to Moses, oh, my Lord, do not punish us, because we have done foolishly and have sinned. Uh, let her not be as one dead whose flesh is half eaten away from when it comes out of the mother's womb. And Moses cried to the Lord, oh God, please heal her, please. Remember, Miriam and Aaron are the siblings of Moses, and they were, they were bickering and complaining about Moses. They were just like, who are you? Who do you think you are, Moses? Like, why are you so special? And, and you know what happens? God says to, to Miriam, Oh, you're trying to uh, go against my anointed, the, my prophet, my, the one that who's, I'm going to give you leprosy. You think you're, when you're going against my leader, my structure, my authority, you're going against me. And so he gives her leprosy as a punishment. No, you can't, you can't usurp God's authority. No, you can't go outside of his lines of, of how he sets up his design. Um, and people think, oh, God is mean. No. Humans are sinful, and he's appropriately acting in a way that helps us see our sinfulness. And Moses cried out to the Lord, oh, God, please heal her. That's the right response. Ah, oh, sin produces death and sickness. Please heal. But the Lord said to Moses, if her father had but spit in her face, should she not be shamed seven days? Meaning her sin cannot go unpunished. This, what her, it was shameful what she did to try to undermine the leadership that I put. It was shameful. And he, and he goes, he's, he's basically saying, shouldn't there be something because of the shameful thing she did? I'm gonna, basically, she, got, she has to be out of the presence at least seven days. And let her be shut outside the camp seven days, and after that, she may be brought in again. Sin for, does not allow us to be in the presence of God. It does not allow us to be in the presence of God because God is holy. God is holy. And when we don't obey him, when we don't follow his design, that's sin, that's rebellion, that's going our own way, it's doing our own thing in our own time. It's wicked. And it requires a response from God because he's so holy 
to say you can't just sin. There's got to be a punishment for sin. And sickness is meant to be a, a learning. It's meant to be a pointer to the brokenness of our world and our neediness to be forgiven and cleansed. And here's the great news. All of this Old Testament law, all of this uh, first century culture, all of this story is ultimately getting us to the point where we see Jesus as the ultimate solution to all of the world's problems. It's Jesus. This is good news. You know, we talk about one in three women getting cancer and one in two men getting cancer. And we talk about all these top ten reasons why people are dying. Do you know what we need? Jesus! Amen. We need Jesus! Am I saying we don't need good health care or good access to those things? No, by God's grace, his common grace, he allows us as humans to study his good world, even though it's broken and in corruption right now, there's still, we're able to, to d- discern things from this world about what works through observation. We're able to learn, but in God's world, how we can, br- we can try to bring about b- blessing and health, but may we never think that it can be done outside of God's hand. May we never think that it can be done outside of Jesus himself. Jesus is the healer. Anytime somebody gets healed from their sickness, it was Jesus who healed them. Because he's the king of the universe. If you read uh, in, in Colossians, he's the creator, he's the, the one who is supreme, and he's the sustainer of life. He keeps us breathing. He keeps our heart pumping. He keeps our cells in our body working the way they're supposed to. Jesus is the healer. Jesus is what we need. Jesus is who our whole life should be about. Following the king who has all authority. There is good news if we are sick, if we are sinners. There is good news. Jesus can cleanse us. Jesus can heal us. In fact, uh, Hebrews chapter 9, I love Hebrews, such a good book. It talks so much about how Jesus is the fulfillment of all that the Old Testament was, was pointing to. Chapter 9, verse 13. For if the, bu- the blood of goats and bulls, which by the way, part of the leprosy thing is they had to spread, uh, they had to make an offering and they had to sp- sprinkle blood on them as a part of the ritual cleansing. And, uh, and there's all kinds of sprinkling of blood. But it says, if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of a defiled person with the ashes of a heifer sanctify the purification of the flesh... Right? He's talking about the flesh. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve a living God? He says if the Old Testament was, was a shadow talking about how you needed blood to cleanse you from your infirmities, Je- Jesus is the one who that all was pointing to. His death, burial, and, and crucifixion which then shows his resurrection, pointing that it was all true. Jesus was the one who that was pointing to, and he can cleanse us not just physically, but spiritually. In Acts chapter 15, we see this idea of being cleansed, being connected to faith. In fact, if you remember in the the leper, he says he believed the Lord, and he said, if you will, you can make me clean. What does that mean? The leper had faith. The leper had faith in who Jesus was and what he could do. And he said, it's up to you, King Jesus, what you want to do. That is faith. Acts chapter 15. This is the Jerusalem council when they were trying to figure out what to do with the, with the Gentiles entering the church and how to handle their life. And he said, after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by mouth, but by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them. And look what it says, having cleansed their hearts by faith. We actually all need cleansing. And that cleansing doesn't come through some physical operation or through some medicinal properties. Our cleansing is an internal spiritual cleansing that comes by faith. Amen? Amen. We all need to be cleansed of our unbelief. We all need to be cleansed of us seeking to be the king of our own life. We all need to be cleansed of our rebelliousness. That's what corrodes this world. That's that's what leads this life. You know why so much of us, I mean this, I've said before, so so many of us 
are so stressed out because we're trying to control the world or we're worried, we don't have faith in God that he will take care of us or we're trying to hold on tightly to this world and do things our way and what we're doing literally is stressing ourselves out because of our lack of faith or because of our weak faith and it's, it's bringing decay and death to our body. And, and I mean this, Jesus can heal us spiritually and physically, physically if he wants, but in the gospel he will heal us all spiritually And whether we get physical healing in this world or not, we will all get physical healing in the future. Sometimes he's so gracious to to heal us, multiple times in this world even. But what we really need is the deeper underlying healing of our spiritual condition. And so I want to ask you, what are those specific areas that you need to be cleansed? What are those areas of faith, those areas of distrust, those areas of control? those areas that are not fully submitted to the lordship and kingship of Jesus Christ, that that bring about worry, that bring about despair, that bring about anything that causes death and separation from God, those sins that we are stuck in. There is good news, brothers and sisters. Jesus has all power and authority to cleanse us, but we must come to him with humble hearts, confessing our sin, And asking, Lord, please, make me clean. Please. I love the promise that we get in in John about confession of sin. John chapter 1, 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Part of being distinctly Christian and part of a requirement of being a a Christian is that you have to acknowledge that that you are a sinner, that I am a sinner, that we are sinners. That's a requirement. That's what the law is there to point out our sinfulness. He says, if we don't say we're sinful, if we don't say we need cleansing, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But, verse 9, if we confess, though, our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. For if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Some of us need to ask for forgiveness of sin, maybe for the first time. I don't know if that's you today, if you're here, and you haven't done that yet. You haven't actually asked the Lord to cleanse all your sin. Well, here's the good news. If we confess our sin, if we actually acknowledge our neediness, and that Jesus is the only way, Jesus is the only truth, he's the only life, that he's the way that we get to the Father, he's the way that we get cleansed, he's the one that we get forgiveness, he will give that to us. And so if that's you, talk, talk to me. We, could, we, could, we can talk more about what it means to be born again. But I do know that there are many of us who actually need ongoing confession of sin because that's what we're called to do as Christians. If you're a Christian, we need to continually be cleansed by Christ. It's not just a one-time thing. It's actually an everyday thing. You know, we talked about this before in the the, uh, prayer of Jesus. What is it, what is we supposed to do when we pray daily? He says, you know, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. It's a daily prayer. We're asking for daily needs. And forgive us our debts as we forgive those who've, who've sinned against us. Meaning, Jesus instructed us to pray daily for the forgiveness of sin because we sin daily. If we say we have no sin, the truth is not in us. We should be confessing our sin every day, and I, really, I truly mean this. Some of us are not living in the fullness of God, the fullness of love, the fullness of joy, the fullness of peace, because we have unconfessed sin in our life, because we don't think we need to confess sin, because we have this wrong view that, well, I confessed in the beginning, and I'm just fine now. But actually what it means to live in the kingdom of Christ is to have a daily dependence and a daily humility and a daily re-upping of our commitment with Christ. By God's grace, he gives us new mercies every day, but he gives us new mercies not to worry about what we did yesterday. He gives us new mercies to obey him again today. Amen? And some of us maybe get really, get really kind of mixed up by that, and they, because we sin so much, we, we, it really discourages us. Like, oh, man, I'm sinning all the time, and, and I just don't want to think about it. 
But uh, I want to encourage us, actually, that it's very important that we understand that we are cleansed by Christ and his sacrifice and are being cleansed. In fact, if you are not, if we are not regularly confessing our sin and regularly understanding that we need and are getting forgiveness, it actually affects our assurance of salvation. It affects our effectiveness in our witness and in our walk. Let me read this in 2 Peter. He's talking about Hey, make sure that your calling and election is real. He's saying, hey, are you a Christian? Have you been called to follow God? Have you, has God chosen you to be his sheep? He said, then you should add, that's through faith, then you should add to your faith. You should supplement your faith by actually living it out. And he gives this long list of what it looks like with brotherly affection and knowledge and virtue and all of these things. He's like, live it out. Your faith will have works. And it's towards the end of that section that he talks about the qualities that they should be doing. And he says, for if these qualities, these, these virtues of, of following Christ, are yours and they're increasing, they keep you from being ineffective and unfruitful in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus. Some of us are being ineffective and unfruitful because we don't actually know Jesus because we're not actually regularly living with him, asking him to forgive our sins, asking him to walk with us daily, asking him to show us more of himself in his word, and it's, it's affecting our daily walk. But look what he says. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he's blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. If you practice these qualities, you will never fall. Some of us as Christians actually need to be very uh, intimately involved and reminded of, uh, that we have already been cleansed and that we are regularly being cleansed. This is an important, like, rubber meets the road part of our Christianity. Are you daily humbling yourself, going to God in prayer, asking him for his strength to live out his will in your life, and does that include regularly confessing the sin that you're doing, or do you not see the sin that you're doing? Here's the thing. If, here's, this is a one-to-one -one correspondence. If you are not asking God to cleanse you from your sin, Jesus from your sin, then you are not actively dwelling on the fact that you are today cleansed again. And some of us, and because we're not acting in the daily experience of the cleansing and the forgiveness of Jesus, we are ineffective of actually learning who Jesus is. We're here for Jesus, to know him and to make him known. We're not here to get saved and go do our thing. We're here to live every single day with Jesus, loving him, learning from him, walking with him, praying to him, obeying him. This world, our lives, are about him. And some of us are being ineffective and not experience the fullness of joy because we're not actually humbling ourselves to say, I need cleansing, I need cleansing. And some of us are so, are, are so uh, beat down by our sin that we, that we actually aren't believing that we're cleansed. His blood is that powerful that he will cleanse you so quickly. Ask him. He's not a stingy God. He has cleansing for us every day. So some of us need to move more towards asking for forgiveness and cleansing. Some of us need to believe that we actually are cleansed. Where are you? I would say there's fullness for us. In fact, let's look at our last point for this morning. It's not just that Jesus is Messiah. It's not just that we can be cleansed. There's, a, there's another dimension to what Jesus is showing here. And it's that Jesus displays his heart to fully restore us to fully restore us. Let's, let's, let's look at what this means here. Because look at, look at chapter 8, verse 4. Look at what he does here. After he cleanses, he says, yes, I'm willing to, to, to cleanse you. Be cleansed. And immediately he's cleansed, verse 4. And Jesus said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a proof to them. And many of us who are not, you know, Old Testament Jews or maybe who are just less familiar with our with our uh, with Leviticus, Jesus is actually continuing to uphold the law here. Uh, in in Leviticus chapter fourteen, it shows what uh, priests are supposed to do when a leprous person comes to them and they're seeing that they've been healed. They see that they don't have the leprosy as much anymore. They're on the mend. Uh, Part of this restoration has to do with being restored to God, uh, access to God, and restored to access to the people of God. Some of us not just don't need, not just simply um, spiritual forgiveness, but we actually need relational restoration. And Jesus brings that. Jesus brings that through his forgiveness of sin. Look, look what it says in Leviticus 14. 
The Lord spoke to Moses saying, this shall be the law of the leprous person for the day and his cleansing. He shall be brought to the priest and the priest shall go out of the camp and the priest shall look. And then if the case of leprous disease is healed, then the leprous person, uh, in the leprous person, then the priest shall command them to take for him who is to be cleansed two live, clean birds and cedar wood and scarlet and hyssop. And then it goes on to talk about all these other uh, sacrificial things and ceremonial things that he has to do. Then going down to verse 8, and he who is to be cleansed shall wash his clothes and shave off all of his hair and bathe himself in water, and he shall be clean. This is a new start. This is a new start. I'm restoring you back to be able to be, you're clean, we're starting over here. Shave your head, get it all clean. And after that, he may come into the camp. He was outside of that camp the whole time. He was alone because of his leprous disease. Now he could be brought back to the community of God, to access to being clean before God. And it says, to, but live outside the tent for seven days. So there's this process by which you're cleansed for seven days. And on the seventh day, he shall shave off all his hair from his head and his beard and his eyebrows. And he shall shave off all his hair and then he shall wash his clothes and bathe his body in water and he shall be clean. This is all a picture of that sin brings sickness and death, but if we have healing, there we can have, and that's, that sickness and death separates us from God and it separates us from humanity. But if we are cleansed, we can have full restoration to God and full restoration to, to people, to people. There's, there's a relational aspect here that is, imagine what it's like to be quarantined. Oh wait, some of us know what that's like as a society, to be quarantined for a long time. That is devastating. It is devastating not to be, have human interaction. It's devastating to be th thought of as an unclean person who can't see or touch. It's, it's devastating to be alone in this world. And Jesus came to, to, to fix that. And it's not just some psychological, God doesn't want you to be lonely. No, no, no. It's the loneliness is an effect of some sort of sin somewhere. And he's saying you were never meant to be alone. You were meant to live with God. Garden In, in the garden, God lived with man. He walked with man. He was in the presence. It's all about being in the presence of God, living with God, for God, to God. And when sin gets in the way and we're, we're, we're separated, and that separation is devastating both with God and with people. And Jesus says, I want to bring you back to fullness of life. It's wonderful. I, I just, must, uh, just must remind us, Jesus was not looking to do away with the law in the sense that he was, not, he was not seeing that the law was bad. The law was good. This is why Jesus go, went and told him, go ahead and do what the law told you to do. The law has a purpose to point out what's behind it. And remember, he just preached. He just preached. Matthew chapter 5, for truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until it's all accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes on one of the least of these commands and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom. So during this time, the, the Old Testament sacrificial ceremonial system was still in place. It was still the temple. There were still those sacrifices. Jesus had not yet been sacrificed. So this is the, the, the point in history in which he's living. And so Jesus isn't saying, uh, I'm going to do, do away with that because it was bad. He's saying, no, we're still under this, and it's still good. Go get restored. Go get restored. And praise God that in, in his death and his resurrection and in his, in his ascension, it's not just as in resurrection. He's completed the work, and now he's ruling and reigning as king now. He's interceding for us now. So let me ask, what areas of separation from God or from people, what are the areas in your life that you need restoration? This has to do with relational separation. What are the areas? Where do you feel separate from God and where do you feel separate from people, especially believers, especially other believers? Now, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't worry about you know, our unbelieving family or those sorts of things, but believers are playing by the same rules. Believers are seeking to honor God with our, with our life and with our relationships. And if we follow Christ, it will inevitably affect our relationships with people. 
It will inevitably help us be brought back. Now, relationships are always, there are two ways. So some of us can be restored up to a certain point because that's as much as it is to us and they don't receive us back. But I want to ask you, where, where are the separations in your life that you, you, that you want to ask Jesus to heal and bring back the restoration of relationship? In fact, um, some of that is also because of sin. In fact, uh, the Bible talks about church discipline is actually a, a loving thing that can bring people back when we call people. I mean, in this church, we, Disciple Church, we want to be a church that has members that regularly practice restoration. We want to be a people that will not let our sin and our preferences and our egos get in the way of the community being out of sorts with one another. Jesus bought our restoration. Jesus bought our peace. Jesus bought our unity. And so the Bible clearly calls us to move towards each other, not away from each other. To move with love and grace and forgiveness and help, not judgment. In fact, just I want to remind us of Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Christ calls, when, he, when we follow him, King Jesus, he will affect every single square inch of our life. That includes all of our relationships. And if we are submitted to him, then we want restoration to, to who he wants to restore us to. And so I want to ask, is, is there somebody in your life, is there, is there some relationship that you really need Jesus to, to give you the grace to either forgive them or to be forgiven by them or to just be more sensitive to them. Some of us just need to be more sensitive. Um, in fact, we're going we're gonna to talk about that tonight, about God's, uh, how do we interact with people who are different and different, who are different in, in life. I mean, this, this has an effect with this whole masking thing or people who differ on things. We, it affects our ability to interact with each other if we're, if we're not all on the same page or if we're not all agreeing to the same rules of godliness. So please come, please come to that so we can talk that through. Praise be to Jesus that he loves us, that he saves us by faith, that he, he cleanses us from sin, he restores us to relationship. Amen? Amen, let's pray. Jesus, thank you. Father, thank you. Spirit, thank you. Thank you for your word that teaches us the truth, that reminds us of things we need to be reminded of or tells us new things we haven't heard before. Please embolden our faith, grow us where we are weak, and help us to love the way you loved so that we can ultimately glorify you and love one another in your name. I pray, amen.